their ability to love, to see the beauty of life, to stay in a state of happiness. And we have a mind to reflect upon it, to contemplate, to think, to rationalize, to use logic. And their functions are so easy to identify. The soul listens, the mind speaks. When you are a good listener, you are with your own self and in your spirit. When you speak too much, you are not with yourself. Therefore, you have deprived yourself of the ability to love and be spiritual. Kela said, I have to speak on the challenges of spirituality. What are the challenges? Spirituality challenges us. And we challenge spirituality. Spirituality challenges us because we are all spiritual. We are all spiritual because our real essence is the spirit. If we were not the spirit, we would never challenge anything. But the spirit confined within the mind and intellect, imprisoned in the midst of thoughts, craves for some expression. And that spirit tries to express itself in its natural language. And we don't allow it to express itself. Therefore, the spirit in imprisonment feels its loneliness and sings a strange song in our hearts, a song of loneliness. And even if you are in a big crowd, in a big company, with a lot of people around you, your spirit still sings a song of loneliness within. Why? We do not listen. We speak too much. Now when I refer to speaking, I don't refer to speaking with the tongue or physically. I refer to speaking with the mind. We always speak with the mind. This tongue will not operate, will not open up unless we use the mind to speak. And even if we don't open our mouth and don't use our tongue, we still speak. What are thoughts? Thoughts are nothing more but the speech of the mind. When we surround ourselves with too many thoughts, we overwhelm and depress the spirit that is buried under those thoughts. People have asked me, how can we learn how to love? And my answer is simple. You cannot. The learning process is reserved for the mind and thought. You only learn what the mind can learn. And if love is beyond the mind, how can you learn it? But there is one way to experience love. Unlearn your thoughts. If you are willing to unlearn your thoughts, not unlearn by reversing all the thoughts that have gone through your head since you were born. No, just put your mind on a shelf on one side and watch yourself. You will be full of love, joy, beauty, happiness automatically. That is our natural state. We are not born as thinking animals. We have converted ourselves into thinking animals by trying to civilize ourselves. We have paid a very heavy price for civilizing ourselves. This refinement of the thought process of rationalization of mind that we have been doing in the universities, in the seminars, workshops, in different places that we go to, even in trying to understand the limitations of the mind, we are using the mind. In order to understand how to get rid of the mind, we are trying to use the mind. I have to speak to you against the mind and I am using the mind. You have to listen to me, how to unlearn the mind and you use the mind. We have wrapped ourselves so much with our mind and our thoughts that we have lost ourselves because we are nothing but the spirit that is naturally in a state of love, beauty, joy, and happiness. You don't learn these things. They come naturally to you. Just don't waste your time too much in thinking. Thinking has never brought love to anybody, anywhere in the world, irrespective of civilization, irrespective of caste, color, creed, any other consideration. Thinking has not brought love to anybody in the world. I have traveled around the world so many times. My last trip must have been the 20th or 25th trip around the world, meeting thousands of people in hundreds of countries. 
and I have not come across a single individual who could say, I thought and thought and created a feeling of love for myself. Not one. But I have met hundreds and thousands of individuals who had the spark of love and they had that experience. However short that experience was, they had that experience of love and they thought and thought about it and destroyed that experience. Thinking has destroyed these experiences of our spirit, not created. And yet, we are constantly thinking about how to find our spirit. Therefore, what is the challenge? What is the challenge of spirituality? When we talk of a challenge, we are challenging a state in which we are imprisoned. The spirituality in each one of us, from childhood to old age, irrespective of age, irrespective of where we are, challenges. You can't stop me. I am real. Nothing else is real. By real, I mean that which does not change. Do you know the entire experience of this body, of all the physical systems that are built into this body, of all the physical sense perceptions and sensations built into this body? All the experiences of sense perceptions not built into this body, whether you call them astral experiences, out of body experiences, imaginary experiences, dream experiences, super dream experiences, super conscious experiences, altered state of consciousness experiences, all those experiences change. Not one of them is real. And what is real? Real in the sense of that which does not change, will always be there. Only thing that does not change is your own identity, the spirit, the conscious motive force behind all experience. The experiencer that is going through the experience never changes. If you consider, examine yourself, even with your mind, what is it that I have ever gone through in life that has never changed, you will find it is your own self which is getting this experience, the experiencing self that has not changed. Experiences always change. Therefore, don't run after experience as a pursuit of happiness and truth. Stay with yourself. Whoever has stayed with himself or herself has found the truth, has found reality, has found happiness, has found love, joy, beauty, all the beautiful things that belong to us naturally. But when we stray away in thought stream and don't stay with ourselves, we lose ourselves and we lose the experience of love, beauty and joy. That's what's happening in our life. That is what is spoiling everything for us. It comes in the way of our happiness in ambition. It comes in the way of our happiness in human relations. It comes in the way of our happiness in using the assets that the Lord has given us. Even the wealthiest people who thought that the dollars they could make would give all the happiness. And wealth is a very important factor in this country particularly. I notice when I ask people, what do you think is real? They don't say that which does not change is real. They say if you have more dollars, that's real. You must have more money. Money is real. But even those with lots of money are unhappy. I've seen them. They come and they begin to complain against the very money which they have accumulated, which they thought will give them happiness. Some have gone to such an extent, they have the money, the purchasing power, they are unhappy, why their labor has more money. And I have seen them groaning under unhappiness, looking at somebody else's money, even when they have money. Therefore, even these beautiful things given to us to enjoy, to get love, beauty, joy, happiness out of, we are using, misusing them to create unhappiness. Our relationships are all soured, spoiled, because instead of using love, we use thought. Tell me, how can you have good relationships between two persons if the relationship is built upon thinking what the other is thinking? And is that not the basis of our relationship? How do we say, does that guy, does that girl love me or not? You think about it. Now, what is that other person thinking about me? This is the basis of relationship. Now, let me put it to you clearly. What is thinking? When we think, what do we do? Thinking is nothing more than running words through your head. 
when words are pumped into the into the stream of consciousness in your head and they go and make meaningful statements we call it thinking and the meaningfulness of the statements is made by the interpretative part of the mind the mind has three parts it's one mind but it has three functions let me say it has three functions the lower part of the mind interprets sense perceptions into meanings if you merely had a sense perception you would give no meaning to it when you see something you say that's the color that's the form that's the shape that's it you cannot see more than that but you say no that's a tree that's a house that's a chair that's a person that's my boyfriend that's my girlfriend that's my son daughter father mother husband wife what makes them all these not the sense perception but the interpretative part of the mind that interprets and then this interpretation is put into words in thought stream that's the middle part of the mind which thinks words are nothing more than sounds they are phonetic symbols sound symbols which acquire meaning because of repeated use of those sounds in association with certain experiences if i keep on looking at this chair and people say this is a chair i will associate the sound not the word the sound chair with this expression this feeling of all the five senses i can have an experience of the five perception senses senses of perception to create meanings for sounds which i call words otherwise there are no words of any language in the world all languages are born by giving meanings to phonetic symbols through association of one's own ideas now the most interesting thing is that from childhood i have grown up i have seen my chairs that were in my house in india and in my village where i visited a small broken stool we called it a chair when i grew up when somebody said chair i thought of the broken stool then i saw a bigger stool somebody said chair i saw the bigger one and the smaller one then somebody said chair as i grew up the concept the meaning of the word chair went on expanding according to how many chairs i had seen but the chairs i have seen none of you have seen therefore when i hear the word chair what comes to me is a chair that nobody else has seen and each one of you has seen a chair that nobody else has seen therefore when we use a word chair we mean different things for different people in fact we can never have identical meaning and yet the thought stream is using these very symbols as language expecting that everybody is understanding exactly as you are understanding the very basis of language guarantees no two people can use the same words with the same meaning therefore it guarantees that you can never communicate with language when you are guaranteed that if you use language to communicate you will not be able to communicate how do you expect that people using words will be able to transfer such spiritual joys like love and you cannot expect it to be put into words therefore words have for an individual created joy and beauty in mutual relationships destroyed joy and beauty but the bigger difficulty is when we don't use language only to experience when we start using language to communicate beyond the experience to build up relationships then the trouble really starts why because then we use that part of the mind we call the rationalizing mind the reasoning mind the mind that employs logic what is logic have you heard of the word logic logic is merely making a statement in words giving an information making few more statements to come to a conclusion from the statements you have made earlier the syllogistic process as you know there are two kinds of logic the deductive logic is the one where you make a statement of fact and then you deduce something from within that statement like i would say this wall is painted white then i go on to say this is a small portion of that very wall therefore it's white i have come to a conclusion through use of deductive logic but i have added no new knowledge what i said in the beginning is what i am saying at the end i am 
fooling myself by thinking that I have come to some new conclusion by using deductive logic. Deductive logic is a restatement of the fact already known. Therefore, you know nothing new from deductive logic. Then comes the second part, the subtle part of the mind, which uses inductive logic. What is inductive logic? That induces a conclusion based upon the premise you already have, which means this wall is painted white and goes white, then turns a corner. I can't see the corner. But since the whole wall is white, that corner must also be white. I go beyond the original statement. What happens in inductive logic? It always leaves you with a sense of uncertainty. Therefore, please understand, this is the very nature of our mind and the thinking process. Every time you think, either you know nothing new or you create uncertainty. Did you know that when you thought you knew something, when you started thinking about it, you became uncertain about it? Try it any number of times. Try to think of something that you know very well. You know something, you say, I know it. Then start thinking about it. And after 10 minutes, you say, I'm not so sure now. This is the nature of the thinking process. Nothing, it doesn't depend on what you thought of. You can think of anything. You start with any thought on which you are sure and go on thinking and you'll become unsure. Now what happens? In our human relationships, when we deal with people, we use thought. Therefore, we are always uncertain of those people. Now what would happen if you fell in love with somebody? Which is natural. Falling in love is not done by a plan. You can't plan, I'm going to fall in love with somebody, I'm going to think my way. You never do it. You can develop some attachment, some feeling, some emotion, but you can never have experience of love. If you have the experience of love and think about it, what will happen? You will create uncertainty about your own experience of love. Now, I have met thousands of people and I meet them during counseling sessions, during lectures, during question and answer periods. And every time I find when they have the experience of love and think about it, they create an uncertainty of their own experience. Even when they start with an experience which is positive and they are sure, they think hard about it and destroy that experience. Therefore, this mind and this thinking machine that is in us, it is the greatest challenge. This is the challenge. The machine poses the challenge and spirituality challenges the machine called the mind. The mind is like a computer. It functions precisely like a computer. I couldn't use these uh, similes earlier too much because you didn't develop such good computers. Now you have. So you can understand. Many of you have worked with computers. So you will understand when I tell you that the mind, human mind, is no different than a computer. It has no feelings. It has no additional source of information and knowledge. Whatever is the input, it can rework it into a new program, new diagram, and give you conclusion. It creates nothing new. It reinterprets, it pumps into logic and brings out the results and creates those elements which the mind, you are experienced to in your mind. Therefore, when you rely so heavily on the mind for your relationships with everybody, how do you expect any, any feeling of unity, any feeling of oneness, any feeling of love, any feeling of certainty, any feeling of self-confidence? Somebody came to me, a girl came to me in Chicago the other day. I said, what's your problem? You used to be so bright. She's gone to school, done very well in school and college, and she's doing very well in everything except she's so sad. She says, everybody misunderstands. I, I can't communicate. I failed in love. I, I had to leave one guy. I had to do this and I had to. What was wrong? The only wrong thing was she was thinking too much. Nothing else. She tried to improve every relationship by thinking about it. It has never happened. Nobody has done it. I, I, I said to her, go and relax. I know you can't stop thinking. I give the example so many times of that Boston yogi. Do you, did you hear my example of the Boston yogi? How many have heard the story of the Boston yogi who stopped thinking? Or thought he did? Or not too many people. You don't mind if I repeat it? If mind is the problem, we should be able to solve it very simply. Stop thinking and start loving. I would give a simple prescription. 
stop thinking and start loving. But this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because you can't stop thinking. But I met a yogi at the Boston Yoga Center. That, that university where I went to school, Harvard, produced many yogis and many people. They tried different yoga. Some took acid, some took mushroom, some took different things. They tried many kinds of yoga. But this particular yogi, also an American yogi, he practiced a particular kind of postures which he called asanas. And he practiced a different system of breathing, which he called pranayam. And after doing the asanas and pranayam, he got into a state of trance, which he called samadhi. But he learned all these three words. So he said, I know the asanas, I know the pranayam, and I know the samadhi. So I get into a state where I stop thinking completely. I said, I congratulate you. I bow my head before you. You are the first guy. I have met many masters, perfect spiritual masters, and I didn't find one who stopped thinking. You are the first guy. I'll propagate you as the most perfect master because you have learned the art of how to stop thinking. But before I do that, myself having been exposed to a scientific, civilizing educational process by coming to Harvard, I just want what all the scientists want. Give me a demonstration of what you have learned. So will you come to my apartment tonight and demonstrate to me how you stop thinking? The appointment was fixed at 9 o'clock at night. And he said he will stop thinking at a precise signal that I gave him. This was the signal. This, I said at 9 o'clock by the watch, I will do like this. You stop thinking. So I asked him how long he can stop thinking. He said half an hour, one hour. I said I don't want such a long experiment. One minute is enough. 60 seconds. I truly believe that if somebody can stop thinking for 60 seconds, he can do it indefinitely. They, if he knows the technique of how to stop thinking for 60 seconds, he can extend it as much as he likes because he's blanked out. So I said, 60 second experiment is good enough for me. So he came, he sat down, he took up the lotus posture, put both his feet up on his legs, and then he took his deep breathing, and he held the breath, and he repeated the mantram, and he got into the samadhi. And he was ready, and I gave him a signal at 9 o'clock. I, I don't know what he did, but I kept looking at my watch. 60 seconds later, one minute past 9, I gave the second signal so he could resume thinking. And the idea was that when he starts thinking again, then we will review, both of us together, what happens to human consciousness that has not gone to sleep, is still awake, still aware, and is not thinking. What happens to it? That was my quest for years to find out what happens to human consciousness if you are not thinking. So after he resumed thinking, we talked to each other. And we had the following conversation. I said, my friend, did you stop thinking for the 60 seconds between those two signals? He said, yes. I did not think at all. I said, fine. Now let us examine from the point when I gave you the first signal. When I gave you that signal, how did you know this was the time to stop thinking? Because you might have thought earlier, I am trying to know after hearing the sound, what happened in your awareness. And I cautioned him, do not tell me a speculative philosophic explanation. The books are full of it. I said, everybody has read all these books. They are all full of concepts, full of theories, full of words full of book knowledge. Tell me exactly what you remember. Tell me by recall what happened in your head when you were not thinking. As I gave the signal, how did you know this was the time to stop thinking? And he remembered and he said, yes, I remember. When I heard the sound, I said, this is the time to stop thinking. I said, that was a thought. He said, that was a short thought very short, couple of seconds only. That didn't take the whole minute. I said, I don't mind. We exclude two seconds. This thought took two seconds. I am not very time bound. You must have an experiment for 60 seconds. We can have the experiment for 58 seconds. Let these two seconds go out. But 
I want to examine the period when thoughts were out of bounds, were not allowed to come in. All right, two seconds passed and you said, I will not, this is the time to stop thinking. Now tell me, after that passed and you stopped thinking, how did you know that when I give you the second signal, you can start thinking? Because if you had not known in awareness that you can start thinking again, you would have gone into oblivion forever. Never thought again. But you must have made some arrangement in your head to start thinking when the second uh, signal comes. How did you do that? Recall, remember and tell me. He said, oh yes, I remember. After I said, this is the signal to stop thinking, I also said, and I will not think till he gives me the second signal again. I said, that was a thought also. We excluded a few more seconds. I questioned him only on this. What? after he stopped thinking, led him to await the signal when he can start thinking. And all the thoughts that went through his head came back to him. In 15 minutes, he held his head like this. He said, oh my God, I thought more in these 60 seconds than ever in my life. And yet he sincerely believed that he had mastered the art of how to stop thinking. Now, why did he feel like that? He did not even know I had to get into that conversation and tell him, listen, I have met some real great meditators. I have met people who are experts in this job of meditation. All that you have been trying to do by learning about it, people have done for years and centuries. And I said the most recent experience I have had of one who really did meditation with deep insight into his thinking mechanism was His Holiness, the Dalai Lama of Tibet. And he had been exiled from Tibet when the Chinese invaded Tibet and he came to India. And when he came to India, he was asked to be taken to Dharamsala, town in India, where by a strange coincidence, I was working as a civil officer. And the government of India made it my responsibility to receive that holy man. And I spent a couple of years sharing experiences and comparing experiences with him. And he was the one who did eight hours of meditation a day under two experienced Buddhist lamas who were his tutor. He was a young lama, a young Dalai. Dalai Lama is the spiritual and temporal head of the Buddhists. I said, that man told me that he had investigated the mind so thoroughly that there was no way of stopping his thinking. What happens is that the mind does not think in one channel. It thinks in several channels. When we think we have stopped thinking in one channel, the thinking machine shifts to the next channel. While one seems to be blocked out, the other starts operating. Now, those of you who are used to repeating a mantra, repeating holy words as part of your spiritual practice, would know that when you are repeating those words, the mind should be fully occupied on those words. There should be no thinking. But have you never heard the voice of a commentator also at the same time going on. You are repeating too fast, too slow. It's time to stop. What am I going to do after I finish this meditation session? Who is that? The same thinking machine using another channel. People who are very observant, very closely observing their own minds have been able to identify one, two, three, four, five channels. The Dalai Lama was able to identify eight channels of the thinking mind. I am mentioning this to you because that simple prescription, stop thinking and start loving, doesn't apply in this world. It's a good recipe to show you the limitations of thinking. It doesn't apply. Then what applies? What applies is keep on thinking, but don't become your thoughts. Use your mind, but don't be used by the mind. What's happening to us is not that thoughts are so troublesome for us, they destroy us. We identify ourselves with our thoughts and become them. I have never come across people who say, a thought came to me like this. They come and talk to me, I thought like this, I think like this, I think that's it. When you say, I think, I think, I think, you become think. You become that which you think. Supposing you remained aloof 
as the spirit, as consciousness, watching your own thoughts. Anybody watch his or her own thoughts? Please raise your hand. Anybody ever sat in the head watching one's own thoughts pass by? Nobody? Please try it tonight. Try tonight in your imaginative self. When you close your eyes and you feel that the conscious self that is questioning, the conscious self that is challenging the loneliness of a human being. When you, the lonely one, puts a question, not the you that is speaking loudly and creating a crowd of thoughts, not that one, not the mind. When you, the lonely one, the listener in you, put it aside, the listener, the experiencer, and watch your own thoughts. Listen to your own thoughts. Don't speak your thought. Listen to your thought. If a thought comes, this is me, this is not a thought, that's a thought. Every spoken word that passes through your head is foreign to you, it's not you. Sit in your head and listen to your thoughts. If thoughts become written words, read those words. If thought becomes an image of somebody who is speaking to you, listen to that. If thought becomes figures and diagrams, see them. Become an observer of your own thoughts. What will you be doing? You will be observing your own mind at work. So let the mind think. But you don't become the mind. Become an observer of your own mind. What will happen? I have put this exercise through workshops. I have made people do it. I have done it. This is only a short lecture to let you know what you can do. You have to do it on your own. If there is a workshop, I will make you do it. Those who want to come to a workshop can try it out in my presence. When you sit and watch your own thoughts, the first reaction is, how can they be so stupid? <laughs> I tell you, when you think a thing, you think you are very wise. When you look at your own what you thought, you say, how stupid? Most of the time, we crowd our head with stupid things. They are so senseless, so valueless. They have no reality, no importance. And we are making them important because we think that's us. I have a stupid thought, my ego will sustain its belief in its own importance and will make stupid things look important. But when I separate myself from the thought and my ego is under attack as a thought, not as the spirit, I laugh. I laugh at my own thoughts. How stupid can one be? You can do the experiment anytime. Any one of you can any time sit down and watch your thoughts and see how stupid they are. But that's not the benefit just to find out the stupidity of your own thoughts. The benefit is you will find out you are not those thoughts. When you find you are not the thoughts, for the first time you will get an inkling of who you are. You are the one that listens to your thoughts. You are the spirit. You are the soul. You are that conscious energy and conscious power within that is sustaining the entire experience, including the experience of thinking. That you are the motive force behind everything that is happening. When you get that experience, you are filled with a tremendous sense of beauty, love. And you open your eyes after that, the world suddenly has transformed itself into a beautiful place. Ugliness has disappeared. When you meet people, you don't know what to say because they are so beautiful. You, the thoughts that come to you are foreign to you. But the love that rises in you is natural to you. And people say, this guy was never so loving. This, man, this girl was never so loving. What happened? And you say, how are people changed? Nobody has changed. You have changed. If you transform yourself, you transform the entire world around you. Try it out. And transforming yourself is not difficult. Just be yourself. I am not suggesting become something. I have never said transformation means becoming something else. I am saying transforming yourself means stop becoming something else. People say, where can we go? Ishwa, tell us some real good place where we can go and transform ourselves. And my answer always is stop going and you will transform yourself. You go too much. All the time we are going everywhere. We are never stopping to see what we are. The truth, the beauty, the love is inside us, not outside. We all hear that. Have you ever heard anybody saying beauty, truth, love, reality, God himself is outside? They all say that. 
But where do we go? We go outside to hear these things. We go to church, temple, mosque, place of worship. We go to workshop, lecture, anywhere except with ourselves. To know that the truth lies within ourselves, we will go everywhere except with ourselves. How will we find truth? Stop going. Stop running. Stop thinking. Don't run out. Be yourself and see the futility. See the futile running around we have been doing so far. And if you stop and be with yourself, you find yourself. You have to go nowhere. I asked a question. I am asking you. Why should I say what I asked? I want to know, do you know if you want to find your own self, how far is it? How far is it? In time, in terms of space or time? How far is it? Did you know that? How far is our own self from us? No distance whatsoever. So you have to go nowhere. In terms of time, where are we? Now. Have you heard this word now? Some people practice in talking of now. I hear they also have now accounts here in bank accounts. I don't know what they mean. NOW means something else. But now is the most beautiful concept I have heard in this country and in the West. And yet the very people who designed the concept of now, who say past is dead, future is still to come, live in the now, live in the present, they have never cared to consider that how can you live in the present when you live in time and space? Because now can have neither time nor space. Now is the only thing that I know of that the human mind expresses again and again, which has neither any time nor any space. Incidentally, I believe most of you by now know that time and space are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. When human attention looks at a thing, at an event, not a thing, an event, a thing in time becomes an event. When human attention looks at an event and talks of then and now, it becomes time. When it looks at the same event, here and there, it becomes space. The same event can be measured in time or in space. Now, we used to think it's very difficult. Einstein must have given some new theory of continuity, continuum, the continuum, the fourth dimension. No, it's not that difficult. When people wanted to reach large distances, like looking at the stars in the sky. And the scientists and physicists began to look at the sky and say, that's a star. It's very far away. How, how far? Abbreviate the description of the distance of a star. And having found out that light travels at a fixed velocity, they began to use the concept of light year, which means the distance that light takes to travel in one year is one light year away. But they forgot that in putting this new definition, they spoke the same thing that Einstein spoke. That means what is so many miles away is also as far away as it will take one year for us to see it. When you look at a star in the sky and you say it is one light year away, it not only means it's so far away, it means you are not seeing it, except as it was one year ago. You can't see it today, because the light of the star takes one year to come to you. The star as it is now, you will see next year. 